in the name. But oh, maybe that's so sweet. <laughs> might have had the other A in there just to be fancy, though. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Rachel Moshman. Please welcome her to the show. It's so nice to meet you. So nice to meet you too. It's been years that I've been watching your videos, actually. I know. Well, you've reached out to me, which I love because I, I'm not shy, but I don't like reaching out to people for the show because then if they don't answer or turn me down, I get my feelings hurt. But you wrote for just, I think it was like another reason. And then I saw that you were a plant-based doctor and I'm like, hey, you want to be on the show? And you said yes. And I'm very happy to meet you. I am too. Well, I need to hear your story. First of all, you look amazing. I, I, I thought you were like 18. So um, good for you. you. I don't know if it's genes or your lifestyle or both, but uh, you're definitely a very good um, advertisement for this way of eating. And I'd love to know how you found out about it and how you're using it, if at all, in your medical practice. Well, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. So I think it goes back to when I was in high school is when I really started thinking about what I was eating, um, but it took me a long time to actually come to this lifestyle. I think really the, the first thing that made me start thinking about food was uh, there's a magazine, Nutrition Action. I don't know if you're familiar, um, but I remember reading an article about food coloring and how you know there may be some association with ADHD in children. And I think that was just the first moment I realized that I have no idea what I'm putting into my body every time I eat. And that kind of led me onto this journey of trying to learn about nutrition. And, you know, I just started watching a lot of documentaries, um, reading a lot of things like throughout my time in college. And I actually was already vegetarian uh, starting in high school for environmental reasons, but I think throughout my time in college, I started to just read, read more, watch documentaries, just open up my mind to new ideas. And it was actually right when I started medical school that I decided to go vegan. And I, it was really for health reasons that I became interested in that lifestyle. But, you know, I kind of <clears throat> learned about all the ethics behind it as well. So it, it all came together at that time, uh, right when I started medical school. And um, that's around the time that I found you on YouTube as well. Wow. So what's it like uh, going to medical school, knowing what you know? Was it difficult, challenging, or you just kind of zipped the lip and got through it? Yeah, uh, it, it was definitely challenging in a lot of ways because, you know, we, we spend so much time learning about pathology and then, you know, we go into the clinical setting and we see so much chronic disease. That's probably most of what we see, you know, at least in, in my field. And it definitely was hard going through medical school, just really wanting to learn about nutrition and lifestyle, but just not getting that. And I really had to go to, you know, my own sources for that, like, um, like Neil Barnard and, you know, the physician's committee and things like that. I kind of had to do a lot of teaching myself on my own, just exploring, you know, those outlets um, because I wasn't getting that for my education at school. Right. Well, as an internal medicine doctor, it, it seems like most of what you see is probably chronic lifestyle disease. Yeah, I would say that's true. So internal medicine, it's all adults. So all 18 and over. And I will say the vast majority of our patients are, you know, I would say fifties or older. And yeah, most of it, I would say is chronic disease, you know, like heart disease, you know, lung disease, things like that. It's so funny that the older I get, the younger my doctors keep getting. <laughs> well, we need a new generation of doctors coming in to save the day. Well, I know. I just remember when you're little, you know, your doctor's old because you're little yeah. and you're old. And then you get to a certain point where like, you're kind of like almost the same age as your doctor. And now it's like all the doctors I had are retired. And it's like, my God, they all look like you. And like, hello. It's so, like, do you how's your, that's fun. So when you went through medical school, did you, did, did, you know, did you talk to your professors or classmates about it and, and, and question it? Or did, did people know you as the crazy vegan, you know, medical student? How was it for you? Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely developed a reputation as being like the, the vegan one. Um, and I really just tried to be a positive example. You know, I, I don't want to be pushy to anyone. And, you know, I, I kind of kept to myself, but at the same time, 
you know, at social gatherings and things like that. And anytime, also there were so many times where at, at school we would be provided with food and, you know, I did not partake in it unless it was like fruit or something, which is very rare. So, you know, I was always bringing my own food and I, I know a lot of people noticed that. And, you know, I just felt like the, the best thing to do is to keep to myself, but try to be a, a positive influence. Yeah. So did, why, why internal medicine? So I think I always had an interest in chronic disease. And while I find it very frustrating <clears throat> sometimes to see the way we handle it, <clears throat> I knew that that was something I wanted to address in my career. So, you know, everyone says the first decision you make is, do you want to do surgery or not? And so for me, you know, while I very much respect people who go into surgery, and I think it is a very important field, that just wasn't something that I was interested in doing. And I wanted to handle issues <clears throat> before we get to the point of someone needing surgery. So to me, internal medicine just made sense. Yeah, that's so cool. Were you able to influence any family members, friends, classmates, professors by your shining example of being a vegan? A little bit. Um, several of my family members are now. And I think as a whole, just seeing the way my family eats now, you know, they, they eat a lot of things that, that I eat now because, you know, I introduced them to the things that I was eating. So that's really nice to see. Um, in terms of, you know, in the world of medicine, uh, I don't know if I've influenced anyone. I, I hope I have. I hope that I have planted seeds in people's minds, but I don't know of anyone specifically who has gone plant-based or vegan because of me. Right. What kind of diet did you grow up eating? So growing up, well, I will say I grew up eating kosher as I know you did too. So I think even though I, I didn't, wasn't plant-based growing up, I think, you know, I wasn't eating fast food. You know, I wasn't going to McDonald's or Burger King, things like that. But, you know, I, I wasn't plant-based or anything close to that. Uh, my family didn't eat a lot of meat. We usually just had meat like on Friday night and sometimes Sunday. Um, but I, you know, we were never having meat like three times a day or anything like that, but definitely was eating dairy, eggs, you know, processed food, things like that. So I would say maybe not the standard American diet. And I think keeping kosher really helped in that sense, but um, definitely not healthy either. <laughs> Right. I, I agree. Cause I think when, when you grow up kosher, like I did, there's so many things, you you know, people can only crave things they've tasted. You don't ever crave a cigarette or an alcoholic beverage. If you never smoke or drink, it's just not possible. And it's the same thing with food. And I I'm so grateful that we were raised uh, Orthodox Jewish and kosher because I never tasted pepperoni pizza. I never tasted a bacon cheeseburger. I never tasted a, I never tasted bacon. I never tasted pork. I never tasted shrimp or crab or lobster or clams or, you know, all these things that people like love or octopus, God forbid, like who would eat an octopus? Even if you're, I mean, it's crazy. So I really am grateful to my parents for that because there were just so few animals available to us to eat. Right. And, um, and I wouldn't eat fish. I mean, that's so funny because even I, I just wouldn't eat it. I mean, anything that looked like it, you know, I mean, the way, the way, you know, they would serve the locks with the head on it or the, the tongue of the cow. It's like, ugh. so yeah. It's kind of cool. So we didn't have to give up very much other than the animals. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, I think growing up, I was sometimes kind of jealous of other people who got to eat all that stuff. But now looking back, I'm so grateful that I never did. Yeah. I just want to take a moment to thank Aunt Dave for the super chat donation. I really appreciate it. Did you have any health? I mean, you're so young. I can't imagine you have any chronic health conditions, but did you have any health conditions growing up or, or weight issues that maybe improved when you went vegan or just maybe felt better, more energy? Yeah. I mean, growing up, I was pretty lucky that I was always, you know, slim and healthy. Um, but I do think that going vegan you know, I noticed certain things that, you know, these are personal anecdotes, I'm not saying everyone would experience this, but my hair just got so much better, just started growing so much faster and thicker. And based on the way I eat, I've noticed how my cholesterol changes. So yeah, it's pretty cool to see the impacts of the lifestyle. 
Nice. What uh, what type of practice uh, do you have? And uh, is it open to patients if they live in, in the area that you live in? Yeah, so I'm, I'm in my residency right now. So I'm not independently practicing. So basically what that means is, so I'm working in the hospital and the clinics and I'm, I'm always being supervised by, you know, attending doctors who are, you know, more experienced than I am. So I'm mostly working in the hospital. That's just how residency is. Most of the training is in the hospital. And then, you know, occasionally I am in primary care clinics and, you know, other specialty clinics, but yeah, it is mostly hospital based uh, for now, not necessarily always. Nice. Do you want to be in private practice or like maybe why don't you go to work for PCRM? Right. That'd be amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say right now. I think I probably would enjoy being in private practice at some point, but yeah, it's hard to see that far down the line. Okay. Well, do you think you'll uh, maybe get a, another board certification, say someday like in lifestyle medicine? Yeah, I'm definitely interested in that. Uh, also, like obesity medicine is another certification I'm contemplating. And um, I'm still open to possibility of subspecializing as well. There are a lot of different specialties that kind of branch off of internal medicine. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot in store for me, I think. Yeah. Do you, now I'm sure you're very busy being in residency. They work you so hard. Do you have time to practice what you probably preach to your patients, like healthy eating habits, good sleep and exercise and getting outside? Yeah, I try to, although it is very hard, especially in the hospital, it's especially hard. Um, Sometimes when I'm discharging patients, I'll try to include some information in the discharge paperwork. Uh, In the primary care setting, it's a little bit easier, although the appointments are usually packed so close together that it's, it is hard to spend time talking about this stuff. But yeah, basically, whenever I get a chance to, I'll bring it up and I'll try to give people information to go home with. Because I also think that a lot of people might not be so open to it if you just bring it up during the appointment. But if you send them home with information that they can read on their own time, I don't know. I hope that people will be more open-minded to that. So that's just something that I try to do, but it's definitely challenging to be going through residency and also practicing lifestyle medicine. I will say that. Right. Uh, just, uh, I don't know what it's called. The person that supervises you, like, do they tell you don't talk about that? You know? <laughs> no, no one has told me not to talk about that. Um, I think it's just, it's really just hard to find the time and so, you know, it's like I'm trying to balance, you know, going over all the, the things that I need to go over with things that I want to go over that I know would help the patients as well. Do you have time to make any food for yourself? I, I make pretty much all of my own food for myself. And that's, you know, my time is pretty limited, but that's, that's what I prioritize doing. So, you know, I, I have one or two days off a week. So whenever I have my day off, I spend several hours just making food for the week and that's, that's how I get through. Apple said she just noted the wording because I always ask the guests to choose the title of the show. And she said, I just noticed the wording of healthy self, very clever wordplay. So you capitalize the T like heal thyself, healthy self. That's very good, by the way. Yeah, I didn't come up with that. I don't remember where I saw that, but it really spoke to me when I saw that phrase. So yeah. So tell us what kind of food do you prepare? I'm guessing you maybe do some kind of batch preparation. Yeah. So I usually try to batch prep like potatoes, <laughs> and, sweet potatoes. and sometimes I'll have other great like grains, like re- brown rice. Um, I'll have oatmeal sometimes. I would say my starter choice is probably potatoes and sweet potatoes though. And then I always have, um, a leafy green and at least one other non starchy vegetable every day. So I try to batch prep all of all that stuff. Um, and then beans, I usually have canned beans, but right now I'm actually cooking some beans on the stove. Do you use Instant Pot? I do. I actually learned about it from you. So yeah, I like to use the Instant Pot for like potatoes, sweet potatoes. So I like to cook them in the oven, but I'll pre-cook them in the Instant Pot. And I also will do like rice in the Instant Pot as well. Right. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you want some trivia, but Jeffrey, who's watching live, said that your last name was an occupational name for a knife maker derived from the old German word Messer, meaning knife. Did you know that? 
I did not know that. Um, I know that my, I'm Ashkenazi Jewish, so I know that my name comes from Eastern Europe. Um, my ancestors weren't from Germany, at least anyone that I know of, but it, that's very interesting. That is very cool. Yeah. Hey, did you ever do your ancestry or uh, uh, genetic? You know, what you know what that testing people do? Yeah. Um, no, I never did. So my dad has a family tree, so I I kind of know a little bit from his side, and then my mom's side. I mean, I just know that all my mom's um, grandparents came from Ukraine, but I never did one of those um, one of those tests. They sound like fun. I think I want to do it because I know people that have found long lost relatives doing that. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's amazing, especially for you know people like us who like we think we know our ancestry, but there's probably so much more that we don't know. That is so cool. Well, if you watch my show, you know that every guest, even the ones that aren't vegan, get this question: What do you eat in a day? And I'm wondering, uh, do you eat at the hospital or do you bring your food? Yeah, so it really varies. I switch it up a lot. I will say I barely eat any of the hospital food. Uh, so. And also, like, since I'm working so much, I sometimes eat at weird hours. But basically, all I'll eat at the hospital is fruit and smoothies. Um, just made with, like, fruit and sometimes nuts, things like that. Um, but otherwise, I'll bring food. Like, so if I'm bringing food, I like to bring oatmeal. Uh, or sometimes I'll bring, like, beans and mixed vegetables. But I feel like oatmeal is just the easiest thing to bring. So that's what I like to bring. And... I will say I definitely eat most of my food at home just because it's easier. Okay. And yeah, I mean, I can walk you through like kind of what I eat. So like I said, I eat kind of like a weird hour sometimes and things like that. And I don't necessarily always have designated meals, but every day I try to have um, a dark leafy green, at least one other non-starchy vegetable, uh, a little bit of ground flax seeds, which I usually have with my greens. I know it's kind of a weird combination, but it's just an easy way to get it. And then I always eat lots of starch, so like potatoes, um, beans. Those are like the most common ones I eat. I would say potatoes and beans. Uh, but I also have like oatmeal sometimes, brown rice, things like that. So yeah, and something I learned from you is uh, vegetables for breakfast. So whenever I'm at home for my first meal of the day, I try to do that. Wow. That's, I love that. You know, you have a healthy, gorgeous person, not afraid to eat potatoes. Oh my God. Potatoes are my favorite. I, my family knows this about me that I, whenever I go home, like there are always so many potatoes in the house and like someone's making me potatoes because they just know like, that's what I want to eat. That is so cool. I, I read that you started a lifestyle medicine interest group while you were in medical school. Uh, tell me about that. Did, how many people were in it? Do you guys still meet? Yeah, so <clears throat> Dr. Brega, I know you've had her on. I love her. She's been on a couple of times. Yeah, uh, I love her as well. So she was the, actually the faculty member who helped start this group. So yeah, there were a few students in the class above me in medical school who, I don't know how they got into it. I, it, may, it may have been from Dr. Brega, actually. And they just said that they wanted to start this group and they asked if anyone wanted to help out. And I, you know, at that time, I didn't know that anyone at my school was even remotely interested in lifestyle medicine at all. Uh, so I jumped on board and yeah, so together we started this group with Dr. Brega. And, you know, I will say as a medical student, it's, it's very hard to find time to do things outside of school. So, um, but it was really nice uh, getting this group together. So at this, I mean, at this point, I'm not in still in medical school, so I'm not still involved. Um, and it was, I think it was maybe in the middle of my third year. So it was closer to the end of medical school for me that we started the group. But, you know, I really hope that what I left behind will stay and that they'll continue to grow. So there, there were, I think there were maybe three girls in the class above me and me who were kind of the main people involved in the group. And then other people, you know, other people, even if they're not really interested in lifestyle medicine, they would still come to our events, which I thought was really cool. So, you know, I think a lot of people just need to be introduced to it slowly and then may realize that they do have an interest in it. Wow. What medical school did you go to? Uh, I went to Temple. Oh, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, I did, so um, I did most of my clinical stuff um, in Bethlehem, which is where, that's where I met Dr. Grega, but yeah. Cool. Why'd you want to be a doctor? 
You know, it's hard to say. I think when I decided that I was so young, but I think just the idea of being able to take care of people and I knew I was interested in health and I just thought that would be a good way of combining like my interest in health with my desire to care for others. And, you know, it led me down this path. Mm. Do you have time to exercise? That can be tough. You know, I, I won't lie. I think, you know, I try to be as active as possible. So like I'll walk around the hospital, I'll take the stairs. You know, it's funny because people always comment on how, you know, like if I'm leading the way, I go to the stairs. When other people lead the way, they go to the elevator. Um, but for me, it's all about just trying to maximize my time as I can. So when I'm already at work, I know I have to be there already. So I try to just move around there as much as possible. And, you know, occasionally I'll do workouts at home, but my goal really is to get around 5,000 steps at least per day. And anything above that is kind of just extra. Um, so that's for the time being. I think I definitely want to get more into exercise, but I think given my schedule right now, I'm happy with 5,000 steps a day. That's great. Uh, what about sleep? Because it, it, it's probably very rigorous being a resident. And back in the day, they used to really brutally overwork them, didn't they? Didn't they yeah. change the law so that they, because people were making mistakes and stuff, they were yeah. so overworked. So they did change the rules. I don't know when, I don't know what year that was, but yeah. So the rule now is that we're not supposed, we're not supposed to work more than 80 hours a week. Oh my God. Which, you know, <laughs> I will tell you double. that. That's still like double, double what everybody else works. Yeah. I mean, I will say that working 80 hours a week is pretty brutal. It doesn't happen every week, but sometimes I am working that much. Um, right now I'm on a, a hard stretch, um, a very difficult month. So for the last several weeks, I've been working about 80 hours a week. It's hard to get enough sleep. You know, I, to be honest with you, when I'm working that much, I'm definitely not sleeping enough. Luckily, we do have some weeks where we're working closer to 40 hours. So it kind of balances out. But, you know, it, it is tough. And also, I don't necessarily even get in bed the, the minute I get home, which I probably should. You know, it's hard because, you know, I want to have time for myself at the end of the day as well. So I think during residency, it's just really hard to focus on sleep. But I do recognize how important it is. And I do hope to get into a better sleep schedule after residency. Well, I was going to ask you what you do for fun, but apparently nothing because there is no time left in your week. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I have a really great group of colleagues I work with, and we try to get together whenever we can. So I would say that's what I do for fun. And other than that, you know, I don't have a ton of time. I like to go home and see my family and friends at home whenever I can. And yeah, there isn't too much time for anything else. Okay, let me ask you this. In an ideal world, if you had a normal schedule, what would you do for fun? I think I would be a lot more like physically active, like doing things outside. I really like walking outside. So like hiking, things like that. So that's probably, that would be my go-to activity, I think. Aaron says, what drives you to work so much? I think, I think that you have to, I don't think they give you a choice on your schedule, do they? Yeah, no, I mean, we don't have a choice. I mean, I will say that I definitely spend extra time at the hospital. And I think it's just because when you know that you, other people's lives are in your hands, that's, you know, that's a, it's a big responsibility to carry. And I think, you know, if I have to stay extra, you know, to update my patient's family members or just to tie things up at the end of the day, you know, that, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So. Sounds like you're very conscientious. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think if, I think you kind of have to be, to be a, a doctor, but yeah. so what, what, you know, you mentioned that most of what you see is chronic lifestyle disease. Like, could you, like, which one are you seeing the most, do you think? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say. I think it also depends. Like I, I, I work on different services in the hospital, but I will say heart related things are very common. Um, and all, lung, lung, chronic lung disease also. So I would say it's, it's probably between those two. The lung disease you're seeing, I mean, it, do, are they smoking related? Do you think people still, I mean, cause I, I, I am shocked when I see anybody, like I, like when I see people smoke now, which is rare, I'm like, people still do that. <laughs> yeah. I will say, yeah. Majority of it is smoking related. A lot, COPD is, is what we see most of, I would say. And 
unfortunately people are still smoking, but I will say there, I feel like I have a lot of patients who, even if they've cut down, you know, if they've smoked a pack per day for 30 years and now they finally cut down, like it's amazing that they've cut down, but they still have accrued a lot of lung damage over that period of time. So, and there are there people who are still smoking as well, unfortunately. Yeah. And there, and then, I mean, but you still have to see them, right? Like you can't say, sorry, I can't see you until you quit smoking. Yeah, no. Yeah, of course. Of course we still have to see them and, you know, we still treat them the same way and we, you know, we try to encourage them to quit smoking, but what, what do they say? I tried, I can't, it's too difficult. I love it. I, I've heard all sorts of different things. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I already have cut down and, you know, and I think that's great. You know, if someone went from smoking a pack per day and they cut that in half or, or, or smoking a quarter, but they used to, I think that's great. I just, I don't want people to think that they should just stop there. You know, I, I really, I want people to, to cut it back all the way. And, you know, I think smoking is a really difficult habit to break for a lot of reasons. I think, you know, there's the, the nicotine dependence, which, you know, it's one of the most addicting substances. And I think also it's just a habit that people develop, you know, whenever they feel anxious, they smoke a cigarette and even just the psychological aspect of that, I think is really hard for people to get out of. Wow. Uh, but th- doing things like vaping is no better, right? Oh yeah. Vaping is, is horrible. And, you know, it's only in the you know recent years that we've been seeing that, but I, I will never forget on when I was in medical school on my pediatrics rotation, we had a 17 year old patient who was really ill in the hospital with, you know, lung inflammation after vaping. And that, that will always stay with me because I think, you know, at first people didn't realize how bad that was, but you know, the fact that even young kids were getting sick from that, I think is really telling. Right. Right. Yeah. I think it must be frustrating though. Cause even in patients with that, I mean, I mean, can a plant-based diet help them at all? If they're in that, in, you know, already have COPD and yeah. advanced lung disease. I mean, I look, I think a plant-based diet or at least a predominantly plant-based diet can help just with your health in general. So I would, I would always encourage people to try to go toward this lifestyle. That being said, if you're continuing to smoke cigarettes while eating a plant-based diet, you're still going to be damaging your health. Um, although I will say, I think most people who are motivated to eat a plant-based diet are probably not smoking cigarettes, at least in my experience. Yeah. I think it's very rare when you find a, a smoking vegan. Yeah. I have never met one. Right. Because even if the person is just an ethical vegan that is not health oriented, they know that the cigarettes are tested on animals, beagles specifically. So it'd be very hard to find a smoking vegan. And yeah. if they did smoke, they'd probably keep it on the QT, I'm guessing. Right. Also really bad for the environment. I can't tell you how many times I see people, you know, throw cigarettes out their car window on the ground and it just, it frustrates me to no end. No. no. Have you noticed people getting heavier since you've been a child? I mean, have you seen that or you just kind of get used to it? Honestly, I think, I think as a society, we're, we're just getting used to that at this point. I mean, I think, I think if you look around, you know, so every time I open a patient's chart, you know, one of the things that pops up is the BMI. And, you know, I think it's actually, it's less common for me to see a normal BMI than, you know, an overrated or, or obese BMI. Do they tell you, I mean, cause I've read so many things about like how there are these cards now that people get to give to their doctor that say, don't weigh me because you're shaming me. And it's like, I mean, there's certain conditions where like, if somebody's like, a, like on Lasix, like you have to weigh patients sometimes. Right. I mean, it's not about shaming them. It's like medical information in time. Yeah, right. Definitely. So I, I actually, I heard about that uh, on your show that about the cards, I have never seen that in, in person. I mean, I will say, yeah, in the, in the hospital, for sure, you know, like you mentioned, Lasix, uh, medications like that, where, you know, we're trying to get water weight off people. A lot of medications in the hospital, also, we do weight basing, like heparin and sometimes insulin. So it, it is really important, for sure, in the hospital setting. Um, and also, even not in the hospital setting, it's still, when we have patients who are taking Lasix at home, we ask them to weigh themselves. And, you know, and even beyond that, it's, BMI is a marker of health. It's not perfect. You know, it doesn't take into account muscle mass. It's definitely not a perfect measure, but it, it does mean something. And, you know, 
we're not trying to shame anyone, but it is important health information. And, you know, I think, I think people should realize that we're not doing this to shame them and that it's really just for their own benefit that we want to know this information. Right. That's thing. I think the only doctor I've ever been to that didn't weigh me was a dermatologist. Yeah. Well, I will say, you know, a dermatologist probably doesn't really need to know about your weight, but you know, definitely primary care doctors. I think it's, it is really important for sure. Right. Uh, Janet, who's watching live says, I love her heart and commitment to excellence. Oh, thank you. That's really nice. Um, so Susanna, who's also watching live, asks, does Dr. Moshman think that a BMI at the very top of the healthy range is healthy or should you be lower? You know, I think when we talk about ranges, everyone's different. So for some people, being at the top of the healthy BMI range is probably perfectly healthy. For other people, maybe the optimal weight is a little bit lower. So I think you need to just you know, think about how you feel healthiest. And, you know, if you're eating a really healthy diet, you know, you're living a healthy lifestyle and you're at the top of your BMI range, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Do you think maybe it's more important to know like somebody's percentage of body fat rather than just the BMI? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's hard to, it's hard to measure body fat. I mean, we don't have, you know, unless you're getting a DEXA scan, we don't really have the best tools for doing that. But I would say yes, because, you know, BMI doesn't take that into account. It doesn't separate out your lean mass from your body fat. So I would say yes, percent body fat probably is more important. Just unfortunately, BMI is just so much easier to measure. Right. Everybody could do that at home easily. If, what is the one thing you wish you could tell every patient I wish I could just tell all my patients that you can control your health in so many ways that you don't even realize. I think so many people think that what happens to them is just bad luck. And, you know, I think if people realize that so much of it is in our hands, they would be motivated to change. And I think it's, it's really hard to get that message across to people because, you know, people have lived so many years thinking this just happened to me, you know, I, I don't know why I developed heart disease. It just happened. It was just, you know, it was my genetics. That's what I hear all the time is it's genetics. And I even hear that from doctors sometimes. And that's really frustrating to me too, because, you know, genetics plays a role in everything, but lifestyle plays a role in so many things as well. And I think we need to make people realize that they have the power to change their health and change their life. What was your favorite class in medical school? Hmm. That is, that is a tough one. Well, I, I'm going to have to think, I'm going to have to think that okay. through. I mean, I think, so we have like, we have our preclinical courses and then we had like the clinicals. So the preclinicals, this is probably very unpopular, but I actually kind of liked the biochem. Uh, and I, I kind of liked it because like we learned about metabolism. So even though it was, you know, it was very scientific, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a fun subject to learn. It was kind of interesting, you know, learning about metabolism, you know, like how you digest, you know, when, when you consume like carbohydrates and how that the biochemical pathways that goes through, I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and then in terms of clinicals, well, I will say I had, <clears throat> wasn't really a clinical experience, but I had an experience with Dr. Grega where I worked at her, um, her like mobile market, which is basically like a farmer's market that she sets up in different, um, different areas. And, um, that was a really positive experience for me. Did you have a favorite uh, professor or mentor in medical school? I would have to say Dr. Grega, even though I didn't work with her in the clinical setting, um, she was definitely a really positive mentor to me. And, um, as well, as well as her daughter, Amanda, who is a chef, uh, and makes all the, all their food. Wait a minute. Her daughter's a chef. Why isn't Amanda on my show? Yes. Uh, I, she should be on your show. Okay. She, well, she, hello. Like, we got to well, have to set that up. Yeah. She, Amanda makes incredible food and like, I will hardly eat food that someone else makes, but I trust Amanda. Anything she makes, I'll, I would eat. 
Oh my God, this is great. Thank you. Please hook me up. Um, Angela, who's watching live, says, who are your plant-based sheroes and heroes? Well, so many people. Definitely you, Chef AJ. You're one of the first people I found when I went vegan um, on YouTube. So you definitely were a big part of my vegan journey. And, you know, so many other people like, you know, Dr. Clapper, um, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard. Um, you know, I could go on and on about, I don't want to leave anyone out, but you know, all the people that you've had on your show, uh, all those people, um, are definitely big influences in my life. Nice. Thank you. Um, what do you have you, or do you watch like all the documentaries that are plant-based? I think I have seen all of them. I mean, I've seen all the ones that were on Netflix. I know they switched them out, but yeah, anytime one of those popped up, it always sparked my interest. Cool. And books, any, any good plant-based books or, or books in general? So books. So this was really interesting. When I was at the beginning of medical school, for some reason, everyone in my class got a copy of the nutrition guide for clinicians from the physicians committee. I don't, I don't even know why. I think someone donated them to my school and we all got a copy of that. And, you know, I'm probably the only person who has ever read it, but I think that's a, it's a really good book to have. It, you know, it lays out everything for a bunch of different chronic diseases and, you know, nutritional recommendations. So I think that's a really good one. It's not, you know, necessarily a fun read for people who aren't in medicine, but it's a good one. It's a good resource for us. And, you know, I've read, I'm trying to think, I've read like um, The Starch Solution. Um, I've read like Dr. Esselstyn's book, um, Proteinaholic by Garth Davis. Yeah, I've read a bunch of those. And, you know, I, I think at this point, I've, re I've you know, I've read all of those books. I've, I've watched you know, talks from all these people. So at this point, I think I, I already know what they have to say, but, you know, I still enjoy reading those books. You think you might write a book one day? I've thought about it. You know, I think if I had something new to share, I would, I would love to write a book about it. But I think at this point, all, you know, all, all those doctors have already covered so much great information. So we'll see. Maybe a cookbook. I have thought about a cookbook. Yeah. Well, cookbook for residents who work 80 hours a week. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think so. It's much needed. Uh, let's see. There's a comment from Annette. She's so young and is so smart and pretty too. So yes, she's a oh. triple threat. And Colleen says, did you have nutrition classes in medical school? And if so, how many? Honestly, not really. I mean, you know, I, sometimes I hear people say, you know, medical students only have X number of hours of nutrition education. I don't know if I would say that I had any, to be honest. I mean, it depends what you, what you count as nutrition education. So yeah, we very briefly touched on things like scurvy, which is a disease that results from vitamin C deficiency, which I have never seen in my life. I don't, you know, it's not really a disease of modern times, at least in places like the United States. Um, but you know, other than things like that, we we really did not talk about nutrition in medical school. That's crazy because uh, another viewer, An uh, Andrea, writes our medical students getting more nutrition lifestyle information now in their curriculum. Have you heard of those medical schools? I actually had one on, but there's more than one where there is like a culinary medicine curriculum where like they actually learn this in their medical school. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty rare nowadays. I have heard of a few schools that that are doing that. Uh, I think those are the more progressive schools. Um, so, I mean, I really hope that that becomes more common. And, you know, I think something that I've heard people say before that I agree with is unless it's going to be tested on our boards, it's going to be hard to get it into medical school curricula because our, our curriculum is really supposed to be based around what we're going to be tested on on our boards. So I think it would be really cool to see you know, I don't, I don't know who's involved in writing these board questions, but I think if we could start to see some nutrition questions pop up on there, it would kind of force schools to introduce courses about nutrition. Right. Cause uh, that's what I heard that even the doctors I've met that have had nutrition, since it's not on the boards, they don't really have to remember it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I will say this wasn't nutrition, but we did one time have a lecture on like alternative medicine and you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't even paying attention because 
I, you know, we had all of our lectures on things like cardiology, you know, all that stuff that we knew we were being tested on and we had to study for that. So, you know, one lecture here and there that, you know, you're not going to be tested on when you have so much to study already, it, it's difficult. Yep. Are you familiar with the work Dr. Clapper's doing moving medicine forward where he's talking to medical students? Yeah. So I tried to actually get that set up at my school and then COVID hit and then everything kind of got derailed. Um, and so, you know, I hope I'm not no longer at my medical school, but uh, I definitely hope that he gets a chance to go to my school one day uh, and talk to the medical students. Wow. That is so cool. That's a, well, gosh, thank you for, I mean, I know you're, you have such a tight schedule. So thanks so much for doing the show. No, of course. I, I really always wanted to meet you. So I'm glad we found a chance to do it. You know, if you're in Philadelphia, um, I'm, I'm sure you've either heard of or maybe even been to Children's Hospital at some point, right? I've heard of it. I've never been there, but yeah, I've heard of it. Because I went to Penn and I don't know if it's still there, but in 1977, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania, I went to the hospital because my roommate's uh, sister was, was, uh, was a patient. And one of the first things I noticed is they had a McDonald's in the lobby. And I'm wondering, is it still there? Do you know? I don't know, but I want to look that up. Um, I will say I've seen a lot of unhealthy food in the hospital, whether it's labeled as McDonald's or not. But yeah, I think McDonald's just kind of has a reputation for being one of the most unhealthy. So it is kind of ironic. It's, it, it's funny how, and, and, there, and when I lived in LA, Children's Hospital of LA had one, and it's funny how they give you cancer, and then they have that Ronald McDonald house for when your kid gets cancer. Yeah, um, there's actually a McDonald's right by my hospital now that I'm thinking about it. It's not in the hospital, but it's right near it. But yeah, I think it is very ironic. And, you know, I think there's been some discussion, at, you know, at least at my hospital, not really, I don't think it's even regarding health, but just, in, you know, regarding the environmental impact of, you know, you know, maybe we should try to have like a meatless Monday or something. And, you know, everyone freaks out because, you know, people just can't imagine a day without eating meat, I guess. And, you know, I, I think if we actually gave people the opportunity to taste some really good plant-based food, they would realize, oh yeah, I, I could eat this. But I think the idea of it is scary to people. You know, I have a guest coming up next month who has a vegan hospital. Oh my God, that's amazing. I'm yeah. really excited to learn yeah. about that. His name is George and he has a, he owns a hospital. It's in the Middle East and it's all vegan. Wow. I would love to see something like that in the United States. Well, go work there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, is there anything in your hospital cafeteria that you can eat other than fruit? Uh, yeah, not, not too much, just fruit and smoothies. And I mean, I, there's a salad bar. I don't, I don't really eat like things that would be at a traditional salad bar anyway, because I wouldn't eat the salad dressing. So I've never actually gone to the salad bar, but yeah, I, I know that does exist. Well, you'll be getting for being on the show, two bottles of salad dressing or what I use as salad dressing, California balsamic vinegar. So you can put them in your scrubs and uh, eat at the salad bar now. Oh my God. That's amazing. I'm so excited. I know. Uh, Connie says she heard that the McDonald's has been eliminated. And Connie also said that ACLM, which if you're not familiar, stands for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, has been working on board questions for a few years and some schools have begun to get them into the curriculum and she contributed to the cause. Very cool. Do you think you'll ever join some of the organizations like ACLM or, you know, all the, all the doc doctor type lifestyle medicine ones that doctors do often join? Yeah, for sure. I think right now I'm not really getting involved in many things that involve like membership fees because, you know, as a resident, I'm not really making a ton of money, but definitely, I would definitely love to get involved in ACLM. I think they're doing great things. And when I was a medical student and I found out about ACLM, I was so excited because, you know, I didn't realize that there was an organization that actually cared about, you know, everything I cared about until I learned about that. So, yeah. You know, I think it's quite possible, and I'll look this up, that that for residents, it's, they either waive it or it's much lower, but I'll, I'll try to find out for you because I'm, I'm pretty sure they take that into account. Yeah, but I'll, I, somebody look it up for me now so that I, yeah, but I, I, I kind of think that they do that for some reason because I was actually remember. Yeah, why. I know that when I, 
uh, when I was in medical school, I went to the conference for free, um, but it was, that was during COVID. So it was virtual. Oh. Um, so that I would love to go to one in person, but, um, but yeah, I, I didn't know that they did that for residents. That would be great. Well, they should. And I'll talk to them because that's only fair. They should, you know, prorate it, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Let's see. I'm seeing if there's any other questions. Uh, okay. Here's one. Um, I am transitioning to a plant-based diet. I tried to go plant-based in the past, but it didn't stick because I felt like I was going through withdrawal, any combinations and how to combat that. Yeah. I mean, I think it goes back to what I've heard you say a lot, which is you really have to set up your environment. So, and look, I live alone. So that I, you know, if you don't live with people who are eating this way, that can be difficult. But I think for, for me, what it comes down to is what I have around like what I have in my home. So I think, you know, it's, it's hard to change your eating habits for sure. But if all you have around is healthy food, that's just what you're going to get used to eating. And, you know, the cravings, I think over time, the cravings really do go away and your cravings change based on what you eat. So I know for me, just, you know, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. I love that saying that, that I hear from you all the time. And for me, it's really just about setting up my environment for success and, you know, for people who live with other people who aren't eating this way, I totally understand why that would be a challenge. And I don't really have the best answer because, you know, I am fortunate to be able to control everything in my environment. But, you know, I would say just if you are buying all of your own food and you're saying, you know, this is the food that I'm designating for myself to eat, um, I would, you know, I would think over time that you would start to crave that. Very cool. I love it. Yep. Thanks for knowing, knowing my famous saying, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. Yeah, I love it. Elodia says, I have been fully plant-based for two months. Once you transition and know deep inside the real reason, then it's easier to do so and sustain the lifestyle. Definitely. Habits are really important. And I think, you know, you, you create what you're used to. That's right. With, uh, you know, all this stuff, man, what you eat today, you crave tomorrow. Yeah, it's really true. Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, do you do any social medias? Or I mean, because can people connect with you? I know they can't be your doctor. Or they can't be your doctor, of course. You can't be their doctor right now, but who knows in the future? Yeah, yeah. So I've never been a huge social media person, but you know, when I reach out to you, I realize like, I really do want to be able to help people. So I did make an Instagram account, which I think you linked below, Doc. Dr. Mosh or Dr. Period Mosh. So yeah, I would love for people to be able to connect with me there. And you know, if anyone doesn't have Instagram and wants to connect via email, I'd be happy to do that. I just didn't want to give my email out to the entire world. But if you wanted to set that up, I'd be happy to do that too. But yeah, anyone who has Instagram uh, and wants to talk to a plant-based doctor, I would love to help you. So I would encourage you to just reach out to me and I would love to chat. I love it. You could have a practice, Mosh Medical. Yeah, you're, you're, you're very creative. I would love to get you on board to help me out. I would, you know, if I, if I didn't do this, what I really wanted to be was, I believe it or not, was an advertising copywriter. I love coming up with slogans and saying, so yeah, man, I wish you lived closer. You're amazing. Well, thank you so much. I, I see great things for your future because, you know, I've had Dr. McDougal on the show tomorrow and he's awesome, but he's 75 and one day he's probably going to retire. So we need to be able to pass the torch of people that uh, uh, promote potatoes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I would be happy to take on that responsibility. Although I don't know if I can ever live up to Dr. McDougall. Well, but you can live up to yourself and you're doing a great job. So thank you so much for being vegan and helping your patients. And uh, I appreciate what you do. Thank you. I appreciate what you do. Well, thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for... McDougal Monday, and he's going to be talking about GI health. He's going to do two lectures, the first on the top half and the second on the bottom half. So if you didn't do internal medicine, I'm curious, what do you think you might've been? Cause I always thought about going to medical school because all my brothers and cousins and uncles and grandparents, everybody was a doctor, but I didn't, I don't like stuff like, you know, secretion, you know, I just, 
So I always thought if I was going to be a doctor, I'd be an endocrinologist because it didn't seem like they had to touch it too much, you know? Well, I will say to be an endocrinologist, you first have to go through internal medicine. So, Ugh. but yeah. um, the other thing I was contemplating was neurology. Um, I've always just been very fascinated by the brain. And I, you know, I thought that was a very interesting field, um, but I didn't want to lock myself into that. Internal medicine is a lot more broad and there are a lot more options down the line. So I went with internal medicine. So probably, it probably doesn't get boring, right? Yeah, there, there's always something new, always something going on and lots of variety. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. In addition to Dr. McDougall tomorrow, I have a bonus show in about an hour with Daniel Vieira. He has a conference coming up and it's absolutely free and the Sharzais are going to be speaking. So please tune in at one o'clock to find out about it. Take care, Dr. Mashman.